Good morning, everybody. And um, it's that wonderful time again. Um, every week, we look forward, or at least I look forward to this time, uh, to be able to share the Lotus Sutra because it's such a wonderful teaching and wonderful, um, a lot of the principles and ideas that I think we can really use. And, and just to uh, recap, uh, we do this every week, trying to bring everybody up to speed about what uh, Master had been talking about for the past seven days. And that's about more than seven hours of teaching. And we try to condense all of that in 30 minutes uh, very quickly. You try not to go over time because there's very important sharings by, uh, by, by everybody later in the next half hour. So let us begin with the Lotus Sutra review. Um, Okay, and, and before we begin, I, I, I will recognize the, um, uh, of course, Sifu and also uh, Sister Elsie from KL, and that's TY, and also Elsie's son, Ung, if I pronounce that correctly. Um, but um, I was just telling them, uh, they seem to be very well adapted to the uh, colder weather these days, um, which I'm happy I see them wearing short sleeve, and, and you can hear me and see me sniffing my, my nose is red already. But this is a good time to come to Taiwan, believe it or not. Um, it's not too hot and it's not too cold. Uh, for those of you that will be coming for the certification ceremony um, in November, in November, the first, second week of November, uh, for those of you that will be coming, please definitely do check the weather. Make sure that the weather is, uh, that what you bring to wear is suitable uh, for the wear in Taiwan. Okay? so. Anyway, let's begin. So last week we talked about the rare of the rarest and we talked about how to cherish the Dharma. I think the last story, which was really, really uh, deep uh, uh, in, terms of, uh, uh, in terms of how we should cherish it um, for those two days where Master wanted to talk about um, the, the, the Dharma, but even if she made the vow to do so, uh, it was very hard. So we must cherish the Dharma and it's very rare that we have the opportunity and we must believe that. So this week, we only have one thing, and that's the right medicine, because the parable that we have been talking about that in the Lotus Sutra for the past week was all about the doctor, the doctor that is the father, okay? That is the parable that we have been talking about, and we're going to focus on that, and we're going to talk about the doctor, we're going to talk about the parable, we're going to talk about the medicine. So first of all, the medicine. What is the right medicine. Uh, what is the right medicine? Uh, before we go on, let me, I think it's important for me to talk about the story, um, the parable. For those of you that already know the story, this is, will be a very quick review. Um, the story goes that um, in this chapter, chapter 16, um, the Buddha was talking about that, uh, that, that, that the Buddha's life, the lifespan of the Buddha, it's actually inf infinite. It's actually very, very long time and oh, infinite. Um, but but then people were, were, were thinking, well, what do you mean infinite? But obviously, you know, Buddha lived to age of 80. So how could he be infinitely alive? Well, then the Buddha said, well, it's like this. And then goes on with this parable of a doctor who is a father to many, many children. And all these children um, are sick and ill because they mistakenly drank some poison. Now, the father, which is a very, very good doctor, offer the treatment and the medicine that will cure the illness and provide it to the children and accept that these children, knowing that the medicine is right for them, but do not take them. So the father, upon seeing that, says that, well, in this case, maybe it's because you think that the medicine has always been there and will always be there and you don't know how to cherish it. Therefore, the father, as a doctor, says, I am going to leave you. I won't be here all the time. And in the future, if you're sick, if you're ill, you need to know how to get the right medicine. And I keep the right medicine here for you and cherish it. Because one day I will not be here to take care of you and you must take care of yourself. And so the father left. And very quickly after he left, he sent the messenger to tell everybody, oh, the father passed away. Now the children, upon hearing that, realizing that the father won't be there all the time, immediately some of them most of them awaken to the fact that they have to take care of themselves and then they start to take the right medicine that's the short that's the story in a very quick uh, overview of what the story is about but we're going to talk about what is the right medicine so um scientifically scientifically or uh, i'm not a doctor so i can tell you clinically but um usually uh, usually what happens is first of all to have the right medicine what do we do we make the diagnosis right 
we first figure out uh, what the problems are, right? And then we find, given this problem, given this uh, symptom, given the symptoms, we had to find the right medicine. And then we had to determine how to treat it, right? Find the right medicine. This medicine is best used in what way? Is it going to be applying with certain heat or pressure or whatnot or how? And then we had to really do it. So there are, at least in my mind, four things. Know the problem. Find the solution. How are we going to implement the solution? And then do it. So as you can tell, it's really not just medical. It's actually dealing with everything that we come in contact with. Everything that we do, every problems that we face, we must first find out what the problems are, right? And then we have to find out what the solutions may be. Finding out how to carry out this solution and then do it. So the correct diagnosis usually it involves what are the symptoms, right? What is the problem? Is it, is it some kind of arm injury? Is it some kind of, you know, leg, bone, or internal organs? And in another word, in our, in the Buddhist term, it's called the consequences, right? The things that we see, the results, the fruit, what is it, you know, what, what is happening, the karma, or what is happening. Going backwards, we always think about what's the origin, what was the cause to, to, to give rise to the symptom. So these are what, um, what the, the master told us that the doctor were actually looking at. First, the symptom, which is the suffering, right? The Four Noble Truth. The first truth is suffering. That's the symptom. Everybody's ill is going to go through the, the, the stages of illness and death. And that, that suffering, you're always going to have something that you can't get. You're always going to have something that you, um, that you don't like and you find something. So it's always going to be suffering. Things don't go your way. And those are the symptoms. Then we figure out, well, what caused all these symptoms? What's the origin of it? And that's the idea of the loss, uh, the cause and effect. So always see the symptoms, know the origin. See somebody who is upset with you, not just be upset with them because they're upset with you, but figuring out what was the origin. What did you do to cause this? So it's all the same, whether it's illness or how we deal with the people. It's always very similar, right? And also know the origin, know the symptom, and know the pathway. Know how that origin actually gives rise to the consequences. So understand the source, understand the end result, and understand how the source actually give rise to the result is part of the, is part of the diagnosis. Everything can be explained through really the, the Four Noble Truth or the law of the cause and effect. And that's what I believe part of the idea behind this parable of the doctor treating the children is that this is really very inherent to our understanding. So the parable is something that's very easy for us to understand. It's not just a story. It's not just a very heartwarming story about, oh, the father didn't really die. The father just said that he, he passed away, but he's going to come back and show up and save the children. No, it's not about the warmness of the heart. It's actually about that we can see this and how we can actually apply and learn about this, just like this, right? Seeing the picture of a human anatomy, we can see where, uh, in particular, the illness or the problems could come from, right? Whether it's the intestines or the stomach or the lung or, you know, it's uh, our muscles or tendon or anything like that. Anything, the blood vein, anything. Given this roadmap, we know where the problem may happen. That's part of the diagnosis. We know the source of that. It could be bad diet. It could be something, you know, bad habit. It could be something that we have done. It could be something that we have taken. So knowing how from the source to the result, that's the three part of the diagnosis. So for the human anatomy, we can do that. What about for our mind, for our cultivation? This is where we come in, the 12 links or the 12 um, cyclic links. Um, uh, this is where in terms of cultivation, in terms of dharma, how we are kept in the cycle of suffering. Starting from the upper left-hand corner, it's ignorance. Ranking number one, ignorance. Always starting with ignorance. Starting with ignorance or affliction. Then we have action. We are upset. We're not happy. We're doing something and then we take action. That action will actually give rise to some of the subconsciousness thoughts, an idea that's left over from the action that we took. Mm, I like it. I hate it. I enjoy this. I really would like to do it again. Well, 
before the action is taken, that idea, that snippet of thought and consciousness, it's actually left in our eighth consciousness, what we call the store, the storage, the storehouse consciousness, and it will be with us. That is why some of us like math better. Some of us like numbers. Some of us like science. Some of us like art. Why? Why do you like art and I like numbers better? Well, that's the thing that remained with us through ages and ages of our propensity, our affinity to these different fields. Some people you see and right away you like them. Some people you see without, without opening mouth, without them saying anything, you already hate their guts. Now, why? These are the things that was left over from our previous encounters, maybe in times before you even know that it happened. So that's number three, consciousness. Now, from this consciousness, this, this idea, this thought, will actually begin to materialize. So here it's talking about it begins to form. It becomes something that's concrete. It's no longer just a thought. It's no longer just an imagination or conscious. It becomes a form. And this form actually takes hold. It begins to feel. It begins to, um, this particular idea begins to grow. Now, this is sort of taking the idea of a baby that is forming in the womb of the mother. However, just like a baby, a child is born, so is an idea, so is a thought. It might begin as a thought that I don't like that person. He just doesn't look right to me, and I don't like that person. And once that idea planted, that seed gets planted in, your, in, the, in, in, the, in the farm that's in your heart, then it's going to slowly grow. It's going to have the six senses of absorbing the water, the sun, the nutrients that you're going to apply to it. Yeah, I don't like the way he walks. I don't like the way he smells. And I don't like the way he talks. Therefore, you are adding on to that seed and it's going to grow. And as, the, as this seed grows, it's going to reach out its tentacles and it's going to make contact. It's going to actually begin to do something and it might not be immediately doing to that person. It could be like you begin to tell other people and subconsciously you pass off this sentiment that you do not like that person and begins to have this um, contact and then sensation. Um, yes, I enjoy this when I put him down. I enjoy it when other people talk ill of him. And then you begin to have this desire. Desire doesn't always mean positive. It might mean negative emotions, strong emotions like, um, yes, I found another person that also disliked the way he talks. Yes, I see another person. No, I don't like him because he likes him. You, you begins to differentiate, okay? The emotion is strong enough that we begin to do more things. And then begin, we begin to be attached to the group that we share the same ideas and we are detached from the other group. And so all these things, the birth and age and death just means that we are constantly changing and very quickly, another thought comes out. And it could be a continuation of the previous thought that's ignorant. It could be the deepening, uh, the continuation of the previous thought. Or it could be a completely brand new one. Like, oh, I like that person. And everything starts over again. That's the 12 links. So the same with the human anatomy. That we have to figure out where our vulnerabilities are. Oh, the germs are going are gonna to come through our skin. Yes, if it's a very heavily air polluted place, our, uh, our, our respiratory um, organs are going to be affected. Or if we are after an acid shower or acid rain, our skins are going to be affected. Our hair is going to be affected. Same thing. Where we live, what we do, knowing where our vulnerabilities are, knowing where the problems might come from are going to be the first steps of diagnosis. Know the problem, know the symptoms. Oh, I am at step number eight. I begin to have this feeling strong emotions about disliking somebody. That's knowing where we are. Knowing what caused it. Ah, it's number one, the ignorance that caused it. But knowing from, from one to number eight actually comes through a lot of conditions and affinities to make it happen. So that's the first step, right? Knowing the symptoms and making the right diagnosis. The second step is finding the right medicine. Because after all, there are many, many things that we can do to, 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 and there are many different ways we can do to fix the problem. One, we can fix simply the symptom. If I'm hurting in my arm, let's make sure we fix the arm. If my eyes are itchy, fix the eyes, right? So it's very, very simple. 
alleviate the symptom is one of the ways to, is one of the medicine that we can provide. Or the other thing is stop the symptoms from occurring. It's not just alleviating, oh, if you can't sleep, then take something to sleep, but making sure that we also stop the symptoms from ever occurring again. And that, is there, that, that means that we can stop the pathway. That just means that from the cause to the result, stop the pathway so the symptoms won't occur again. Okay, so you can fix at the end, fix in the middle, or remove the source of the illness. Those, that's what the medicine is doing. It's trying to figure out if I can fix the source, if I can alleviate the symptom, or I can stop the pathway so the cost, the seed, never becomes the fruit. Those are the different types of medicine that we can use or the different ways we can do very similarly. And so this is what uh, Master said a couple of days ago about the particular medicine. And in the rough translation, Master was talking about how to, how to, um, how to make the right medicine from the raw material itself. And it has heavily, heavily um, in influenced by the Chinese medicine, the herbs. How do you get from the herb to the actual medicine? So just like um, the, the, the mortar and the pestle, you go through grinding and beating of the, of the herb through careful selection. And this is talking about selecting, selecting the right herbs and doing the right process, mixing the right mixtures at the right proportion, grinding and beating step by step. The right medicine is then created. Okay. Um, and then she continues, right? From the raw material to the medicine, whether it's pills or medical bombs that can be applied. Okay, so from the very raw material to all these final products that can be applied and used to cure from start, from the very beginning when they're raw to finish when they can be used uh, for our illness. Through very careful processes, we have to apply the medicine in the ways that's most appropriate to the illness. And what I wanted to, what I wanted to, um, bring out, and, and I apologize for the translation, it's not 100%, okay, and I apologize, this is always going to be the case, but what this is trying to tell you is, is that even the medicine, the pill itself, the bombs itself, right, it's going to go through many, many and long, long and arduous process of trial and error. It requires a lot of time and experience and trial and error to make it happen, just like penicillin. You know, it's something that was coming out of a mistake, but it still takes a lot of clinical trials to make sure this is safe and it is the right thing. So this is the same idea and what Master had been talking about, that how did Buddha know what the right medicines are? Very simple. How do you know what is the right way for your child? The same thing because you have been there. You are an adult. You have walked more years in life than your child. So you have more experience and therefore you have walked through the days and the, the life events that he is or she is going through. That's why you know how to apply. And how did you go through your life experiences? Going through trial and error, going through beating and grinding, going through from the very start to the very finish. You learn your lessons. That's how you're passing on that experience. This is the same way that the Buddha knew how to apply the cure to all of us we don't know it, but the Buddha knew it because he remembered. He took all these life experience to heart. We are learning, and then he's giving us that's the direction. So what this is telling you is that uh, what, what I'm sharing here is the right medicine. It could be just alleviating the symptoms, right? We're talking about the hospice care. The right medicine isn't trying to combat something that you can't fix. That's part of life. But in that treatment, the correct treatment is actually to make the person feel less pain, to make that person feel loved. That's the right uh, medicine, and that's only to alleviate the symptom. But in the other cases, it could be that you cannot stop the source, you cannot, you cannot stop the symptom, but you can stop the pathway from going from the seed to the fruit. Same idea. In the soil, you already have the weeds growing, right? What we do is we keep on cutting off the weeds, but stop. If we stop giving the water, would the weeds stop growing? Absolutely, but you also kill the crops. So there are different ways to do this. You can stop at the beginning, stop at the end, or stop in the middle. That's what this is telling you. And every single steps 
takes careful process and it's all part of the learning. So the third step is determining the right treatment. For example, now you have the medicine. You have to know how to use it, external or internal. You don't want to ingest something that is for external use. That's why any medical bomb has it. It says for external use only. Please don't ingest. Form of treatment. Does it come with pressure treatment, temperature treatment, shock treatment, chemotherapy, and any of that? And the treatment dosage. How heavy do you want to do this? How often? How long do you want to do this? So all these are very important to maximize, to optimize the effect of the treatment. You must know how to get, um, how to do it right. The time, the uh, the amount, and the form. So all these are very. This is this is not even science. This is just common common sense. So how we can determine the right treatment is it's the last. So. Um, as we have shared before about the six perfections, um, out of these 12 links, just like a human anatomy, we know that there are problems and vulnerabilities. We know that's us. We are easily to be attached to greed, to anger, to all these desires. So how do we apply the six perfections to make sure that we don't have any of these problems? Well, just like the right medicine, just right, just, just like the right treatment. For example, um, precept. The precept allowed us to avoid making contact with things that we're not supposed to be in contact with. For example, if we can uphold the precept of being a vegetarian, which is do not eat meat, even if you cannot, if you're not strong willed enough to make sure that you don't eat meat, the one thing we can do is stop going to the steakhouse. Stop going there. Like you sit there and say, I'm only going to order vegetable broccoli, steamed broccoli from the steakhouse. But everybody around you are eating steak, juicy steak, huge, flavorful steak that you all of a sudden remember how it tastes. Yes, you're going to be eating the broccoli, but maybe the next time you're going to say, well, it's not so bad if I have the A1 sauce on the broccoli and imagining you're eating the steak. The next time you go there, you might just be thinking, I will just have that one filet. It's, it's not a lot. This is how precept works. Stop you from the contact to stop you from doing something bad. But is it going to work? It's not going to work all the time. Because next time, you're not in a steakhouse and you're thinking about steak too. So what, is, what happens? Precepts can only work so far that you need to endure you need to, when the sensation comes to your mind, not through your physical contact, but when it comes to your mind, how do you stop it? Endure. Yes, I like it. Yes, I recognize that, but I'm not going to eat it because I need to uphold the precept and I need to endure. This is part of my training, part of the difficulty, part of the affliction and suffering. And you have to find the equanimity, the serenity in your heart when your heart tells you, I really like to eat that. Well, stop trying to tell yourself. So these are the right medicines at the right time. You can't tell somebody who is about to eat the precept to tell them, endure. Well, it's really, really hard. So right, applying the medicine at the right time is also very important. And that's why, uh, uh, that's why the treatment, the forms of treatment are important at the right time, the right dosage, and the right direction. Okay, so this is just giving you a way of knowing what to do and lastly, it's apply the treatment. Simply follow the instruction and do not stop until the desired effect is reached or until the illness or until the, um, the, 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 the problem has faded. So apply the treatment. You go through the first three steps. If you don't do the last step, I'm sorry, it's just not gonna work. In the America, there is an organization called the Alcohol Anonymous, and this is the AA, the, what, what's, uh, Alcohol Anonymous is an organization that is used to treat the alcoholism, right? alcoholics, the people that are addicted to alcohol, right? It has 11 steps, okay, 11 steps. First, you know, from recognizing that you have a problem. Yes, and that's why they go in circle. They, they all sit in circle, and then they all talk about, I have a problem. I, my problem is with alcohol. Recognize the problem, but same thing. The first 10 steps you can follow to the letter of the word. If you don't do the last step, it's not going to work. And what's the last step? And this is the amazing part about Alcohol Anonymous. The last step is 
help another alcoholic to combat their problem. So you have the first 10, you get it down to the letter, but if you don't apply the last one, it's not going to work. Same thing here. Diagnosis, know the right medicine, know the treatment. If you don't apply, it's not going to work. So this is very simple. It's actually very common sense. So the reason why I want to talk about this, and, and we're coming up to an end, um, 30 minutes is very quick, goes by very quickly. But the reason why I want to talk about this is, what is the right medicine? Is it the medicine itself? That's something for us to think about. The three ages of Buddhism, and I want to talk about this. The age of the right dharma, the age of the sem semblance dharma, and the, rate, and the age of the degenerative dharma. What this means is that um, the first 500 years after Buddha passed away, at that moment, the first 500 years, the dharma, the teaching is still with us completely. We still adhere to the teachings. Very, very solid. We still remember. We still know how to practice it. It's right. Okay, the first 500 years. Then the next 500 years after that, is what's called the age of the semblance dharma, which is only in form do we follow the dharma. We don't really know why, and it's slowly fading. We don't know the principles, but we still follow the form of the dharma. Do you still pray? Are you still doing something kind? Are you still doing this? Yes, I am. Age of the degenerative dharma is after the first, the two ages, which is 1,000 years. Then it begins at a time of 10,000 years where there's no form, and it's the, everything is degenerating, decaying, and the dharma is not left anywhere. And that's where we are, actually. Um, uh, well, that's where we are. So what does that mean? It means at the age of right dharma, the medicine is there for us, and we're taking it, and we know how to take it. The age of semblance dharma means, yeah, I'm taking the medicine. I don't really know why, and I'm really not cherishing it, but I'm taking it because my parents told me to, because somebody that's wiser told me to. At the age of degenerative dharma, I might not even take it because I don't believe it, I don't want to, I'm not even sure that I need it, and I don't even think that I'm sick. What does that mean? It means that the medicine, what is the right medicine? And today, I think these few days, the focus has always been on the medicine itself. But these last two days, Master was talking about the idea that what about the children? The children finally realize that without the father, they have to cherish the medicine. And I think, just for me, my personal, I, my, my personal feeling, the medicine isn't the medicine itself. The medicine is for the children to realize that they must stand up for themselves that the, the Buddha will not always be there, but the Dharma will. That medicine will always be around them if they know where to look, if they are willing to look. But they must believe the medicine isn't this particular sutra. So what I'm trying to say, this is KL. And everybody knows this is probably, this is during the, Buddha, the Buddha's birthday ceremony. If we are in this ceremony and we are one of the members there, and we don't know why, and we don't know, we, or we, don't, we might not even care why, then this is like taking the medicine, but not really cherishing it. This is like taking the medicine, or, or like what Master said two days ago, we still love the Buddha to come and care for us. We still love Master regardless, but we are not really learning and following the teachings. And this is what this is the dialysis center from in, in Penang. Same idea. All these are hospitals that's in Taiwan. All these are forms. But do we really understand the core? It's not the hospital. It's not the medicine. But it's the software. It's the people. It's the mind. It's the love. It's the care. That's really, in essence, the most important medicine for us to take. So, and I'm, I'm, I'm willing to go a little bit further. And I think... It's not even the sutra itself. That's the medicine. People, and Master said, oh, so the Dharma has been left to us in these words. It doesn't mean that we, this, the words, are the real, real answer to everything. It's once we understand the teachings, the ideas behind it, we can make it into what we can use today. 
and the understanding of cherishing this, understanding of how rare this is, understanding of what our own problems are, seeing the human anatomy picture, knowing where we are wrong, knowing where we fell, and knowing how to pick ourselves up. That's the right medicine. And that's the idea, not the medicine itself, but the process of finding the cure and the solution and believing that the solution and cure is all around us. That's what the Buddha has been trying to tell us from chapter one, that we all have intrinsic Buddha nature. We all know where the cure is. It's not in the writing. It's not in somebody else's Dharma talk. It's in us. But those writings and the Dharma talk is to tell us we can do it. But before you found out yourself, let me show you how. Let me show you that this is the medicine that was left over and it works. More and more you're going to believe those are all skillful means because you haven't figured out the medicine from within. You're just using somebody else's medicine. Those are all skillful means until one day the true medicine comes when the Buddha says, I am not always going to be with you. I am going to leave. That's when today, today, Master talked about that the children realize that they cannot always rely on the Buddha. They need to stand up, learn from themselves. That's when they reach in, find out that they have that Buddha nature all along. They can do this too, and so can we. That's the true medicine. So what is the right medicine? Do not fall into the form like, yes, we're all city volunteers. We are volunteering in city and then we're doing something good every day. And that's it. No, that's just the outside. Taking the medicine in the bomb and putting it on your skin and thinking, I am getting it fixed. No, not just that, but also, what about your heart? Are you kind to others? How are you dealing with the people that you don't like? How are you dealing with the obstacles and the, the problems that confronts you? Are you learning how to fight these problems through the sutras? That's the true medicine. And if we are not learning that and only sticking to the form, like, oh, I'm going to city every week. I'm listening to the Dharma every day. I sit there and listen, take notes, and remember, cry when it's really touching and laugh when it's really funny. That's all fine. That's all important. That's the medicine on the outside. But what is the right medicine? It's to know that we have it inside. Have we found the true medicine inside? And I believe that's what the Master is trying to tell us. Do not just attach the form, but also what's inside of the form. Remember, the age of right dharma, going from the age of right dharma to the age of semblance dharma is 500 years. But it's not 500 years, the first second after the 500 year, it becomes the age of semblance dharma. It's decaying through time. From the very first moment when the Buddha passed away, every second, our views are slowly fading. We are forgetting. We are attached to what the Buddha said, what were the exact words. If it doesn't fit, then it's not right. And that's where we have the, 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 the three different vehicles. Oh, you are that vehicle. Oh, you are that religion. And no, it doesn't fit us. When did the Buddha ever talk about this? It's always the teaching. It's all, we're, we are the one that's doing the differentiations ourselves. And we make it stick to it. I am the, uh, the, 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 this vehicle and you're that vehicle and I'm better than yours. We are making that distinction ourselves. When in reality, it's the same path. It's just the door smaller or the bigger, or the door is round shape, it's an arch, or it's a square door. <laughs> There's really no difference. We're still on the same path, and that's it. So what's the right medicine? It's the belief, knowing that this is the, what we need to do, and the medicine is inside, and always take that. And that's what my sharing is today. Thank you all. Um, for the for the idea to sh uh, for the opportunity to share with you and hopefully that we can really see where the medicine is so um, let's open up to today's sharing and I believe um, brother Zihui is prepare something very um, fascinating for all of us thank you two persons to share from Sri Damansara today uh, one is sister Aki she'll be sharing a short story uh, the uh, one she left out last uh, last Saturday, and another one is Brother Zihui. Um, we talk about good morning, Sufu, good morning, Brother Joe, and all brothers and sisters around the globe. Can maybe we start off with Sister LP?
Uh, good morning, brothers and sisters. Uh, I would like to share one short story uh, which happened on October the 1st in Tingsu Hall. Uh, it was, uh, Tingsu Hall was preparing a uh, Deepavali fest uh, festival for all those uh, Indi uh, most, uh, Indian Hindus, you know. So um, actually I have my own uh, uh, care recipients that we brought in for that day. But what I want to uh, share with all of you uh, with all the brothers and sisters, is one incident where a sister walking, as you can see the picture, she bashed into the room and uh, actually she wanted to have someone wash her feet. Her feet, is it? because we have a ceremony on that day. Then, uh, because uh, we need their next of uh, their children, right? The children to wash the feet for them. So he was, she bashed in and happened to go out. So uh, then the person in just asking her whether she got her children around, she said no. Then I was facing her. Then she, she said that she wanted to wash her feet with no children around. So the sister asked me whether I'm prepared to wash for her. Then I say, uh, okay, no problem. Instantly, I just said no problem. Uh, then I lead her to the place. So in my mind, I was wondering, this is my first time washing your feet because I haven't washed the feet of my, of my parents before. So when the ceremony starts, I try to go through the images of my relatives, my parents, because I wonder how to address this uh, care recipient here who have bashed in, how I'm going to wash your feet because I do not know anything. So I was visualizing going through and then really when I start to wash her feet, uh, according to the instruction given to us, uh, I can feel that, you know, uh, the sensation, the bond between me and her. And I heard that she was crying. Then I told her, because I did not look at her, so I told her, uh, it's okay, uh, doesn't matter, you treat me as your sister. I just say it that way. And then she cried even more. Then, uh, because I was using the towel, watch and then uh, massage her feet to the toes. Then she kept on crying that I, I do not know what to do. Is it? Actually, I do not know what to do. I just keep on saying, don't worry, don't worry. It's okay. You can take me as your sister. Then she said, oh, no, no, no. You are my daughter. This is my happiest day in my life and I will never forget this incident. So I was, I did not look at her. And then we are asked to, after washing and massaging the, her toes, we are asked to uh, bow, see? So I do not know actually how to bow, what to do. So I just remember suddenly, Shin Fa Xiang, that we need to make three bow. So I just bow and then I kiss her feet, bow under her feet, you know, three times, kissing her. And she cried even more. I think somebody went, came over to give her a tissue or what. Then I said, no, uh, don't cry, don't cry. We are one big family in Suchi. And she said, oh no, you are my daughter. I will always cherish and remember Suchi. So I think this is the uh, seed that has been planted, not only in her, but also in me, my eight consciousness. It's all due to a spur at the moment from the five senses, the wisdom of accomplishment and the profound insight, how I react on the spot, because it's a very short time. Actually, as you can see in this picture, this is my actual care recipient that I should tend to, but I really make a preparation for them. The other one that bashed in is just a, a new person that I do not know them. So I felt that, I feel that we have really planted the seed of them knowing Suchi, and they will know how kind Suchi were because they keep on telling me, oh, the people here are so kind. Uh, they ask them whether they'll come again, they say yes. Because initially, even my own care recipient, they are so reluctant to come. It's after a few uh, round of um, talking to them, they only they come. And then at the end of the day, when they share with us, I mean my own care recipient, she was saying that she also being touched by the people in Suchi and the environment, the atmosphere. So I think this is the most important lesson that I learned through Shin Fa Xiang. We just don't take the sutra like what Master said, listen, 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 and don't activate it up. So this action really, uh, because this uh, lady was crying and crying, she, we hug her, I hug her, and she cried even more. So I have to do the shape of a house. 
this is we are one big family. No, she even cried more. So I just want to share this little incident that have also impacted my life, make a great impact in my life that what Master says, go beyond race, uh, religion and all that. And I find that, oh yes, it's working in me now. A little, uh, a little of wisdom now grows in me. Thank you for the sharing today. Hi, <laughs> sister. Happy. Okay, uh, now we have Brother Zihui to share. Good morning, brother and sister. Thank you for having me today uh, to share my personal understanding about the basic of uh, Buddhist teaching. Every time when I visit the uh, Qin Shi Hall, I will see these uh, six words, which is the Wen Si, Xiu, and the Jie Ding Hui. Wen here is mean listen, okay? Si is thing and Xiu is practice. J is the observe the precepts and thing will be called concentration and lastly the wisdom. Of course, when we listen to Dharma, we must always listen with uh, listen gratefully, okay? Because not everyone have the chance of our life uh, to have the chance to listen to Dharma. And we must always listen respectfully because all these are all these are the wisdom. Okay, and we always have to listen mindfully because we not only listen but we must always think what are the meaning behind this Dharma and how it can improve our life and eventually uh, have the wisdom. Then, when we think, we must always think rightly. Okay, in the eighth, eighth, uh, eighth path, the first path will be the right view. Okay, so we always must have the right view. So we must think rightly, deeply, and wisely. And then we will practice. We must practice diligently, honestly, and also joyfully. Because we know that doing this, this will bring merit to us and also to help others, okay, to end the suffering. Jie, precept. Nobody can force us to observe the precept. We must do it willingly. And not only willingly, constantly and objectively, okay? And concentration. We must always confident with what we learn about uh, the Buddhist, uh, Buddha's teaching and calmly and faithfully to what they're teaching. Lastly, we will have the wisdom. Okay. I think if you look at the six words, Wen Si Xiu Jie Ding Hui, if you look at word by word, it's very simple. It's look very simple. This one means just listen. We listen to what... Uh, the Buddha taught, okay, then we think how it apply to our life and sister suffering. But we must also practice, okay, but how, how when we want to practice, the first thing is to take the precept and concentrate and, 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 and to create the wisdom. So if you look at this, this is very basic, but I try to relate it to my own understanding to, uh, to another level where it's a uh, Related to how what what is called by small vehicles, medium vehicles, and great vehicles. All right. So when everyone are born into this world, we say that we are born into the firehouse. Okay, this firehouse is full of suffering. What kind of suffering? It is a eight suffering in life. Okay, it's suffering of birth, of living, suffering aging, suffering in, uh, sickness, death, suffering of parting from the love. Suffering of meeting what we dislike and suffering of not giving, getting what we want and suffering arise from the five components that uh, constitute our mind and uh, body. Okay. But some of us might have the chance to, to hurt the one, okay, and knowing the Dharma. Uh, what's the Dharma about? It's about the true, four, uh, four, no, four noble truth, okay, four noble truth. When we heard about this, we some we, we, we know that about some suffering. Some some are suffer because they have their own illnesses. Okay, some are some are suffer because they see others surrounding us are suffering. So they would like to look for a solution to want to understand what caused the suffering, and to have chance and knowing that there are there are there are solution for for this suffering through knowing the four noble truths. First, you might know the cause of the suffering. And 
what's the cause and that's a chance to end the suffering and that's a way there's a way to end the suffering okay so just like just like um somebody might look for solution when they are, they are sick they look for medicine okay so they would like to go and round and round and look for solution but some are some are looking for solution because people around them are suffering so but in one another anyway they still go look for solution and finally they found there's a way this is the four noble truth okay when somebody found a, a way okay they understand what's the cause of the suffering of course in buddhism we know that the the, the, the suffering is caused by the four five uh, poison which is the desire anger del delusion ignorance or pride or jealousy okay so the purpose of practicing uh, buddhism is the to to cease this suffering to cease this suffering just like if a person is ill he understand why this person is sick because of imbalanced diet uh, in an uh, unhealthy uh, lifestyle okay uh, uh, negative thinking all this so these are the poison to to a uh, physical health but the poison to our mind is the desire anger all this poisoning so he find a way he he he, he wants to have a healthy lifestyle cultivate a uh, uh, balance and healthy diet he always want to have a positive thinking so in in, in buddhism we we try to practice using a small vehicles small vehicles to eliminate all this fine poison by doing that we must cease from suffering from from the uh, five to six suffering which is the suffering from parting from love uh, meeting what we dislike and getting uh, getting what we we're not getting what we want all this but but we still cannot cease of one another suffering which is the birth the re the rebirth okay this rebirth is still we still come back to the world no matter how you practice to to stop the uh, uh five poison to eliminate the five poison but when there is a single thought of ignorance okay we come back we come back we rebirth into this world then we have to start again again and again and again and again so how how so people are wondering so we rebirth in the six rhymes on so if you're not in the hu hu human right well, we might not have chance to hurt and knowing the dharma again then we will be worse now okay all right so people are thinking so if i practice small vehicles i still cannot stop from rebirth if i cannot stop from rebirth i cannot stop from suffering so there are so another level that people look to move to another way we start to think how to stop how to stop rebirth by if you want to stop rebirth we must understand why there is a rebirth so then we study about the child cyclic assistant actually my sharing today is a lot aligned with what uh brother john shared okay so when we start to think okay start to think why there is a rebirth why what caused the rebirth then we must understand the child cyclic assistant it's just like initially you want to stop to be get sick okay so you try all the way to have healthy life all this but you still do not understand what caused the sickness so you want to be uh go to go to research and development you you might be a, a scientist so you start understand Im immunology how this virus attack you how your immune system work okay so you practice the uh you you fully understand this then you you, you try to practice as a a media vehicles that where you, you try to put a shoe a shoe uh externally okay to stop the wireless to attack you okay but the thing that that you do know that actually there are already some wireless within you you can stop whatever external but some wireless already in your in, in your in your body store somewhere it's called a storehouse store somewhere is looking for a chance for them to attack you again okay that is the the conscious the third third uh third uh item in the status consciousness that that's just the wireless we try to remove that one okay so um eventually by practice more vehicles we still cannot stop from rebirth because of the 
ignorance from the beginners, beginningless time. That's the wireless store in, in you, but actually you you do know when is when is it where it go into your body. Okay. So how 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 to how to do that? How to stop that? How to stop from come back again, come back and come back, even you, even though you practice the small vehicles. So then we come into the third, the, the great vehicles where we need to practice. We need to practice and our master already give us the, the solution, the medicine which we need to practice the six parameters. Okay. By through, going through all these six uh, perfect perfection, okay, we want to seek uh, enlightenment, okay, and this is go to the this will link to the another three words as Jie Ding Hui. This is actually the essence, all right. Um, these are great vehicles by going through the small vehicles, medium vehicles, and great vehicles. Hopefully, in our lifetime, in any of our lifetime, we we will get enlightenment, but we choose to come back. We choose to come back from the small vehicles and medium vehicles. We come back not by choice, but if we practice free vehicles, we come back by choice because we, after we have get enlightenment, we want to come back to help all others uh, sentient being to get to the stage also to practice the great vehicles also. Okay, so um, and we need to go through the eightfold path. Okay, eightfold path to to attain this stage. All right. So uh, let me wrap up. So today I share with share my thought about uh Wen Su Xiu Jie Ding Hui. Okay. So it's it's related to the one is uh we, we heard about the four noble truth, how to cease all the suffering. But we still do not uh we still come back, we do not stop the recognition. When we, we, we try to understand what caused the recognition, where is the six cyclic assistant. But it's still we still it's not enough because we still come back because the the ignorance of the beginningless of time. Okay, so how to do that? How to cease the recognition? But we choose to come back uh, because we want to help others uh, by practicing the six parameters and following the eightfold path. We will able to do that. Okay, so that's my understanding about Wen Su Xiu, Jie Ding Hui, and the small vehicles, medium vehicles, and great vehicles. Please share your view and correct me if I make any mistake. Thank you very much. Good morning, brothers and sisters. I am uh, really blessed to be here. Um, actually, I uh, didn't mean to be here in this uh, in this uh, sharing today. Today, but uh, yesterday when I saw Brother Joe, then I thought I thought to myself, "Oh, I have to be here, and um, I need to be more diligent in uh, in reading the Dhamma." Uh, uh, the 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 all the uh, um, translations uh, by the brothers and sisters because uh, it's always a lack of time for me because I was uh, always uh, working very late into the uh, into the night. Uh, but I will make it a point to read the the uh, the translation every day from now on. That's okay. That's all my sharing. <laughs> so. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And this is what we need. You know, this is like. A family. I know. I know. I know. Elsie's son is here, but but we're like you know the family. You know, always encouraging each other. And thanks so much for the sharing today. Um, really giving you know shedding light on something that we knew, but then this is so much clear. So thanks everybody, and we take more opportunities um, in the future. Okay, so Sister Xiao Qing, if you find more, and if we know more of um, anyone who would like to share. That's wonderful. We would like to hear more from you. So thank you, everybody. And this is a wonderful sharing. And we will see each other again next week. Can't wait. See, we haven't even finished yet, but I can't wait for next week already. Okay, so maybe next week we have somebody from KL. I don't know. It would be wonderful. I know, you never know. Um, so the most important thing is we have each other and we have the Dharma. And that's why, just like Master said, we are not alone. You know, the father might have left us, but we are not alone. We have each other. So thank you. And we'll see each other next week. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye.